of those um, uh, recognitions, uh, you and I both share that. So I'm in a good company. Uh, are you, you guys able to sh see my presentation, right? Uh, my slide deck, let's see. We, we see the whole deck, like we see the tiles, we don't see the individual. Uh, like it's not the it's not in the full screen mode yet. Right, right. I'm trying to oops. Uh, present. Okay. Hopefully that is coming up. <clears throat> All right. So um, the title or theme is uh, that are taken is cyber social threats. Is AI ready to counter them? Um, I. I want to acknowledge my postdoc, Ur, and um, I also uh, have uh, uh, Manas Gaur also helped. Um, usually this is a team effort, as you may be aware. Um, after I started uh, uh, working on that, uh, on this talk, and this is the first time I'm giving this particular slide deck, um, so my presentation may be a little rough. Uh, I realized there's just a lot more that I, that I can fit into the time. So, um, uh, and uh, Muninder had told me that uh, this would be a diverse audience. Uh, so, keeping that in mind, there's a little bit more of defining the problem and the challenge is a little bit less uh, than usually we would have in terms of giving a specific solution or specific uh, going under the hood in terms of the AI techniques. Um, but, um, in everything that I'm going to talk about, there are a lot of publications and others. So um, I welcome you to um, interact with me and my team, and uh, we can point out to you uh, in some of, in many of these cases where there are more papers and um, things. We can uh, you know go go deep into them. Okay, all right. So um, I moved uh, in 2019. Uh, to University of South Carolina and start this AI Institute. And uh, we've grown very fast. Uh, I moved with uh, six of my teammates from Wright State in Dayton, and uh, we're now about 25. And uh, the AI Institute has already a joint collaboration with uh, more than 10 colleges on the campus. So on this picture, you see the uh, technical areas that we are currently active in. Um, and uh, on the writer's right side, you are seeing the um, uh, uh, areas of application or interdisciplinary AI work that we are working on. Um, and uh, let's see if there is a way to highlight. Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about the two areas at the bottom, uh, social good and harm and uh, public health. They're kind of related because a uh, number of public health applications we have uh, worked on has to have to do with um, um, social data and social media particularly and its implication of public health. And in, the, in that context, um, for you know, conspiracy theories uh, that are applied to, that are being used for uh, some social issues, but also public health issues as an example, or rumors or other things of that nature. Okay. Okay, only the mouse allows me to, um, you know, forward, so, okay. Just take the exact recent example, January 6th and January 20th. And this example, uh, you know, has huge implication, implication at the heart of our democracy and democratic institutions. And uh, also the, uh, the rift that we have in the society, uh, it brings that out very, um, you know, vividly, very, uh, you know, very clearly. And uh, here you see technology being heavily used uh, to support the harmful actions and events. Um, and one of the technologies is social media, other is 
AI. And AI has helped, and we'll touch upon some of those issues. It has helped to kind of supercharge the ability to bring harm, to ability to um, support a harmful action and so on. And there are a lot of things that again, we need to do. Again, AI can help deal with um, containing the harm to identify what leads to the harm and variety of other uh, topics. In fact, um, later on, I'll show you that um, a whole bunch of uh, interdisciplinary fields, including psychology and anthropology and communications are play, can play a role and will have to play a role in containing um, the harm that uh, this, this technology enables. Uh, recently, I'm, I've come, I'm of the view that um, some of these technologies have become, at least in the short term, more harmful than they have been helpful. There are a lot of things that I will talk about in this talk and uh, things that you can further extend, where you see that perhaps the um, effort that we spend, at least in research, seems to be more directed towards uh, containing the harm than to do good things. So. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, that, that's an interesting uh, observation, isn't it? That um, we are creating the technology and then we have to use the same technology um, to deal with that harm. And in fact, we end up uh, spending so much of our time in, uh, now what is happening here? I, uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, in, in dealing with the, problem we have created for ourselves. Um, what could have been done or what could be done? We can predict, plan, protect, identify, um, and, and uh, counter, right? So there are a lot of uh, pieces of uh, technology that we have to bring together um, to counter the problems that we are dealing with. Um, What has exacerbated problem is not purely technical. Um, one of the things that is apparent to me and many others is that uh, often because of the commercial interest, some of these companies that own the technology are unwilling to do all that they can do. Um, they uh, are, have prioritized making money over any of the social good. And this has been a huge problem uh, and this is not a technological issue and not something that we can address today. One interesting point uh, to note is that uh, one of the huge problem social media has is uh, toxic content and toxic, you know, it's a very broad term. Uh, it could be harassment, it could be radicalization and so on and so forth. And um, it must be the case that handling this challenge is extremely hard because if it was easy, then Facebook would not have to hire 30,000 of this content moderator, right? If it was easy and if technology could have easily solved this problem, let's assume that, um, uh, uh, you know, they've chosen to handle the problem, even if it might reduce their money-making enterprise. Um, the 30,000 people that it has hired uh, or, or whatever number it is now must be costing company a lot of money. If it was easy to hire, uh, address, well, they would have done it, I would say. Two of the technology reasons, and there's, I'm sure, a lot more. I'm just going to focus on um, these two of the many is that understanding the content, understanding the motivation, understand the, uh, uh, the action takes a um, lot more. And for two particular things it takes is context and knowledge about the domain. And interestingly, the technology, the AI technology that has done so fabulously well, the statistical learning, the deep learning techniques, 
still have not come up to incorporate to address or support these two issues very well and that's you know if one or two things i want you to take away is exactly that so um there is huge amount of content and there is a huge effort to use this huge amount of content to make to make this intelligent systems so a uh, big one of the big things in ai recently has been this uh, large models gpt3 being the latest that um have been trained on very large amount of data but the hammer kind of approach you know big hammer kind of approach blunt sided approach actually has ended up being its severe limitation we're going to look at that to some extent um and additionally the technology has significantly boosted the way um things uh, you know boosted the ways to cause harm through disinformation conspiracies extremism violence and toxicity these are some of the ones that i'm going to try and talk about given the time now um okay just further narrowing down to covid-19 you are seeing so many problems one of the interesting thing that i wanted to notice and share with you is that this real world events seem to be supercharging this long standing problems so here you see content where you know coronavirus is being used for extremism and radicalization coronavirus is leading to self isolation then just today or yesterday i you know saw a major story about the increase in suicide um and 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 various other reasons why people are killing themselves or or hurting themselves or addicted and so on and so forth other related issue is this harassment um harassment has been there in the physical world but online harassment is far more complex is easier to reach other people there are different norms on different communities there are um we had one of a uh, couple of my students uh, did a paper uh and that received a huge um Uh, i guess media coverage in times magazine and uh, various uh, international media and all had coverage the work was on 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 use of curse words and um, uh uh you know on the content you'll find that there is a very large uh, percent of content that is have curse words and the interesting thing is that um we had uh and we demonstrated how people are using curse word and a uh, lot of interesting insights came through that then we started working on the topic of harassment uh, on social media and interestingly um, some of the people earlier work had used um, curse word to train the classifiers um uh to identify whether that content might be toxic or might be harassing in the context of um and then but in and when we analyzed that we found that curse words were used between the, among the teams very freely and that many uses had nothing to do with harassment right so the use of language has changed and that also makes the things very very difficult or complicated let's look at the fake news rumors and disinformation one interesting thing here is that uh, the same problem 
has it can be seen from many perspectives. For journalism, it could be trust issue. For political science, it is human behavior. Psychology, it's uh, this is making progress. Computer science, detection and classification, analyzing users, network, all of those kind of issues. For interesting perspective, it is modeling cognitive, neural, and social perspectives. So um, we did an interdisciplinary proposal, um, uh, and that involved uh, neural models, uh, people in psychology and uh, brain sciences. Uh, that involves psychologists and um, people in technology and social uh, in social sciences, and then in the middle people in the technology, the kind of things that we can in computer science do. Um, in the context of rural, rural, the next you know thing below on the uh, bottom left is uh, about uh, dealing with the rumors. Um, so these tell you that if you want to solve some of these problem related to social harm, Computer science alone is not going to cut it. And that um, to that makes it for, you know, so that what happens is that um, you look at a problem, it looks like, you know, it, it looks like a big problem. It, you know it's a big problem. It looks like uh, low hanging fruits and you build a little classification system and say you can identify harassment. No, it's far from it. So as you look at some of this problem, you really have to a big challenge facing you, and small time of thought are often very difficult. Uh, I mean, are often very limited in solving the real problem. Two of the things, as I said, I want to address are context and domain knowledge. Um, there are problem, so many of these problems are such that. Let's say you really have to understand the content. And the people that were, have to understand the content are um, not that easily available. Or you may end up using wrong people. After all, a lot of AI techniques, particularly deep learning, uh, machine learning, depend on so-called training data. Somebody has to uh, create this data. Uh, I remember, uh, um, Using we had built we had built a big system called Twitris, um, and uh, Twitris was uh, in 2016. I took the Twitris system and licensed it from the university where I developed it, and started the company called Cognovi Labs. Um, and the company is doing very well, uh, but um, we used Twitris system to. Uh, predict elections, predict, um, uh, we predicted Brexit, for example, uh, before the polls, uh, before the polls closed, before the US market closed. So one of the customer was uh, a hedge company. Uh, we predicted 2016 election when everybody was at 60% um, uh, for Hillary, we were able to predict that. We, heck, we predicted even uh, Alabama Senate election. So that was a huge matter of pride. But one interesting thing that happened was that we had a sentiment analysis algorithm and it, it used training data. So after uh, some time, we noticed that the data, uh, that the algorithm is performing poorly. Well, what happened was that there is a concept drift the algorithm was trained uh, with the pre uh, with the pre, uh, primary data during the primary uh, uh, com com campaigns and um, content changed completely after when we came to the general election mode of the election so that is one challenge that you have to face but the other challenge was that a lot of times we have we use our students to uh, come up to create the training set. Well, most of the students, uh, you know, were uh, foreign students um, and did not have good understanding of uh, U.S. election. 
And uh, you could see that some of this content was very hard for them to understand and interpret. That created another challenge, right? In the current political discourse, for example, if you don't have QAnon knowledge and data uh, that's within the last year, it won't work. You need to also understand QAnon's belief uh, system knowledge and the events that occurred and the change in the language that occurred. So in just research time, um, there was a big, um, um, you know, uh, change in conversation on Jan 6, before, just before that and after that. And then in Jan 20, when actually Biden was um, inaugurated, you know, it became real president, this whole, you know, the whole group of people who thought that that will never happen had to change. They are facing real world and they, now their language completely changed, right? So um, our famous GP3 model, which was trained on data before uh, until October uh, of 2019, would have no clue about it, right? Um, so what we have to do uh, is to another context, for example, stages of radicalization or ideology for QAnon through contextual dimensions using the knowledge. And that's why we come up with uh, a series of techniques, uh, knowledge infusion in machine learning or deep learning and NLP. Um, and, and we have talked about using different types of knowledge and we have talked about different types of deep learning technique, whether it is CNN or LSTM or uh, reinforcement learning. And you have to understand the uh, people content network aspect of data. So the understand this to understand the complex problem, data alone is not sufficient. Big models will not solve the problem either. And you can't use X to uh, when a scalpel is needed. Blinding using web and social media data is, is, is shown to be immature for real world use because the data contains harmful racial, sexual, and other biases. This is well understood now. The un unintended spread of harmful, uh, harmful content is accelerated online through this online platform. And um, you know, state-of-the-art models will likely or actually shown to amplify and magnify the problem. One of the uh, aspect has been that of gerrymandering uh, the election district. And there um, you use AI both for uh, come up, coming up with the gerrymandering district so that uh, you are more likely to win and um, countering the gerrymandering with um, um, maps that are uh, more fair uh, to, 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 you know, uh, to the democratic process. Again here, uh, is, this is a good example where you can use domain um, experts and uh, keep humans in the loop and you can't let the algorithm say, here's the data, take it over and come with the results. There's this concept of malicious intelligence. And uh, here, um, the fact that um, people have tried to use data to train, uh, the concept here is that if you think that you can come up with a technology that will train itself from big data, good luck, because then you'll have what happened with Microsoft AI chatbot that quickly got trained into, um, you know, badly with the racial um, aspect, you know, uh, uh, you know, badness. So, for the foreseeable future, you really have to think about um, involving humans or what you can derive from the humans captured as a form of knowledge or experience to be very important. So when you talk about harms, there are many different kinds of harms. Uh, and I listed here some of them and that has many negative impacts. Again, I'll list some of these things. So I'm sure you can very quickly scan and get a sense of that. I'll save some time. One of the things that has happened 
is a, a whole variety of biases. And um, here I've kind of just outlined um, uh, biases, uh, particularly the ones that are Mark star. Uh, these are particularly relevant uh, in the context of use of social media. So you have population bias because you take data from one class of people and then try to apply to other class of people. That has led to a lot of things, uh, a lot of bad things. Uh, your behavioral bias, for example, if you take Twitter data versus uh, Reddit data, on the Reddit, uh, you are anonymous. So you will take liberties that you will not take on Twitter because you are not anonymous, largely not anonymous. And so um, also the normative bias, the norms that uh, different platform use. So on Twitter, you at least follow some norms and there are strong, um, uh, at least there are some uh, guidelines that the company follows and they will, will stop you. On H-chan or Parler, Parler became very famous recently, that there are no such norms or hardly any norms of that kind. And so you'll find very, very different content. So um, historical bias, many, many things are there, uh, but uh, you know, that cause bias. And this has also become a very important uh, challenge on uh, uh, in the social media and technology. Distress in public institutions is one of the huge things and we have seen, uh, 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 you know, the impact uh, upfront very recently. Now, with the, all these kind of challenges, and I discussed all of them, um, I'm going to talk about knowledge a little bit, uh, very broadly. Um, uh, these are some of the uh, in the area of semantics. Uh, I've been around for a while, uh, and these are some interesting um, things that we've done uh, in the last 20 years. Um, my first uh, run into semantics goes back to 1988, 87. But um, let's just look at recent ones. So there's a, the first patent on semantic applications in semantic web talks about uh, how you use semantics and knowledge graph for search, browsing, personalization, recommendation, advertisement, and such. Then I coined the term smart data. Uh, and then we start, then uh, Pablo Dominguez uh, made an inter, you know, very good point with this phrase, data alone is not enough. Um, and then uh, I had a keynote on knowledge will propel machines of content. So I showed um, in four different applications how the knowledge uh, changed the improve upon the outcome of uh, state of the art machine learning. And now we are working on knowledge infused learning of how to infuse knowledge, shallow, semi-deep, deep, deep infusion into uh, deep learning algorithms. And then we're doing a variety of applications, question answering and uh, virtual assistants and uh, a whole bunch of things like that. So the operative word, the technology toward is your knowledge graph. Uh, most of you are aware of that. Um, this is just a structured representation of knowledge that has become very popular. And there are related forms and terms that are used ontology, knowledge base, lexicon, knowledge network, and such. There are many ways to create knowledge graph, and uh, we can give a tutorial on that. Um, I have given a tutorial on that. But this is just one example where there's structured data with uh, literally more than 10,000 um, bubbles here in this cluster from which we can filter to create um, specific um, you know, um, knowledge graph for books or for uh, movies or whatever you want. And um, this role of knowledge now has become very um, pervasive, comprehensive. Um, here, um, uh, we talk about a pipeline uh, of uh, processing that start with knowledge extraction, alignment, cleaning, and then knowledge mining and knowledge-based question answering and many other things. This, this I just fit in our work in the context of uh, this uh, seminar given by some guys at a course in, uh, in Stanford. Let's see how we use knowledge graph and in this kind of social harm application. 
one of the um, things that we have looked at, and I'll come back to this later on, is um, the system called Sacademic that we have built. But this is to study um, the challenges related to mental health, uh, addiction, and gender-based violence uh, during uh, COVID. And um, in this case, what you'll see here is that you start with a lexicon for gender-based violence that we had developed. We had a study um, uh, a few years ago, another of my um, um, uh, uh, highly capable PA student like came up for uh, Hemant Purohit uh, worked on this topic and uh, uh, we manually built this uh, gender-based violence lexicon and uh, analyzed content from uh, five nations, uh, Philippines, South Africa, Nigeria, US, and uh, uh, one more, and uh, studied uh, gender-based violence in these different uh, countries and the different types of violence, physical, sexual, and so on and so forth. And um, we took that lexicon and um, ex used it to extract related concepts from DBpedia so that now we have many more concepts, so synonyms or related terms can be identified so we can have lot better recall in finding the content related to whatever you're doing in this case, gender-based violence. And then we enrich the uh, lexicon uh, for gathering more abstract meaning of uh, GBV tweets. And uh, for the COVID-19 tweets that uh, came from, uh, uh, you know, from the from social media platform, uh, we, uh, computed the uh, GBV kind of stuff here. But the point here is that we got a uh, very high recall um, uh, and, uh, and also had precision because uh, these terms are uh, kind of organized and uh, later on you'll see that um, uh, same terms used in one context could be a violence and other contexts not a violence. Um, one of the, uh, you know, areas that you know very close to me now is this combination hybrid AI systems or neo symbolic systems and particularly enabling that through the use of knowledge. So there are a lot of people working on this area but um, particularly um, how the knowledge can be can make this uh, combination possible. Um, and, and the analogy for me is uh, you know I'm from cognitive science. Uh, in cognitive science literature there is something called a top brain and bottom brain. And um, uh, reasoning uh, implied by top brain processing with the statistical processing perception uh, implied by bottom brain processes. We're trying to combine them through knowledge. Interestingly, our brain does both, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of things, but uh, there's nothing that we do in which knowledge is not involved, right? Just, just imagine that. I mean, you're listening to me, but uh, some different, you, uh, you know, my audience is from different areas. And even in computer science, they are from different sub areas. So they all are going to interpret what I'm going to say or pay focus on different parts of what I'm going to say. And your knowledge is very critical in understanding what I'm saying. Then why do you believe that deep learning that only focuses on using the data would be sufficient or good enough? It won't be, it can't be. Uh, let's look at one or you know uh, two, three topics in more detail. Uh, I kind of realized that I have too many more things to talk about. So I'm going to be able to only cover part of this thing. I'll put this online and you know people can um, you know look at the parts that I have not covered today. Um, so um, one of the things that we realize, and a point I made earlier, is that um, uh, many of these problems cannot be solved uh, purely by computer science. And um, so we, um, you know, we, we uh, came across an empirical model developed by a political scientist called um, uh, Dil Dilsod Akilov from UMass um, and we uh, understood, you know, so we, we took that, I'll talk about that in, in next, but 
it was necessary to analyze the content in context to get uh, deeper understanding of the factors that characterize um, the the radicalization process, and uh, you know, the empirical model you know helped us characterize on this uh, five level uh, zero one two three four level of um, radicalization, and how the extremists, how the uh, jihadists were using social media to take um, uh, disenchanted youth. Uh, through this process in a rather systematic way. That's the kind of thing that we are trying to understand there. How did they engage and how they use different uh, concepts, different uh, contexts. Uh, so uh, the three particular, you know, dimensions that helped us, you know, understand this thing and that came from the empirical research is religion, ideology and hate, hate and violence. So what we what we set out was to try and understand the content um, and the conversations that happen for uh, in the context of radicalization and recruiting of uh, uh, you know uh, of, of young people online by jihadists in this you know using this so for example um, in the islamic uh, uh, you know uh, radicalization jihad is a very important term uh, in the religion but it can have different um, you know meaning in different contexts uh, first of all jihad can be used for very you know in a positive way in the way it is meant in the religious text and uh, it could be for peace and uh, blessings and that is here classified as ideology it can be used for radicalization, so in the religious context, and it can be used for um, hate and violence. Correspondingly, what we had to do was to uh, analyze the context from uh, content from with respect to different contexts. So the dimension or contextual dimensions of religion, ideology, and hate. That you see here on the left hand side, we uh, we set up, we created um, uh, ontology or 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 or, or uh, word you know models. Uh, so, for example, we ex created a, a ontology um, called religion religious ontology uh, from Quran and Hadith. For ideology, we use the books and lectures of ideologues. And for hate, we use a hate speech corpus. So these three were created. And then what we did was, you see on the right hand side, that we were, um, we create the models for each of the three dimensions where you use the domain knowledge and uh, in the corpus. And then we created the models that could study or understand or decipher the content in each of those um, uh, uh, three contexts. So that then we came up with this dimension-based knowledge enhanced representations. So here you will see um, kind of what is happening underneath. If you look at jihad and it is used in religious discourse in extremist context, you will see the other terms that are associated with that. But if you see jihad in the non-religious, uh, on the religious context, in non extreme content, it, there were many other things that were there. But we wanted to make it more specific. So on the right hand side, there are three examples, right bottom. And uh, two of them map to the negative use of jihad, while one is mapped to the positive use of jihad. And they had to be separated. You can't, a syntactic thing that just uses what jihad would be, would, would take you, you know, Astray. And um, uh, there's some work that done. I'm going to pass for because of the limited time uh, on on identification of uh, outliers. But this problem is very the, the problem that that we are dealing with is very challenging because suppose you make a mistake and suppose you and I end up identifying somebody who is not a um, 
a jihadi or who's not an extremist and call that person an extremist, that's a huge cost, right? That would be unacceptable. So high precision is hugely important. Uh, there's some, um, uh, you know, uh, insights uh, that we had uh, on, on domain specific knowledge and its importance on uh, false alarms uh, and uh, the, you know, big, big problem that can cause misclassification. And, uh, you know, so those are the important, otherwise they, they, they will face discrimination. And then uh, other thing is how um, these three dimensions came together. Uh, Psychedemic is a uh, system for uh, understanding adverse psychological impact of COVID-19. And uh, the things that we are studying was our mental health, uh, depression, anxiety, addiction, and gender-based violence. So here you are some examples, social media, uh, reveals impact, uh, you know, um, so uh, here you can see mental health, addiction, and violence uh, related things. And the architecture you see is given here. Uh, you, we had Twitter data, tw 2 billion since March, uh, and, and 700,000 um, articles, news articles, and a whole bunch of sources for knowledge extraction. And then we kind of extend the kind of uh, architecture that I've shown you before with the knowledge infused NLP, uh, uh, you know, techniques uh, that uh, then were applied. So just to see, for example, let me uh, give you um, a very quick um, three minute demo. Uh, Carolina, to use AI and big data to get deep insight in, into what is coronavirus doing uh, to the society. This is once in a century event about significant impact of this pandemic and we that we want to study. Our approach involves using deep domain knowledge about issues of mental health and um, addiction and combine that with deep learning algorithms to use what we will be we'll able to we've been able to use this on a corpus of so 700,000 uh, news articles. We defined an empirical social quality index called SQI that aggregates over these challenges. Our analysis focuses on relative SQI between states, especially how states are changing in their relative ranking over time. Of course, the prevalence of COVID-19 affects SQI. Right now, some states are doing well and some are just managing, but that isn't the whole story. SQI is also likely the effect of external events, in particular government restrictions and coping responses. In fact, Patterns of SQI change emerge that cluster states together. For example, during a four week period, these states start out okay, but decline as indicated by the increasing yellow color. Group of states shows different patterns of reactions. This is how SQI is changing over four weeks of time. States such as Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Nevada, Connecticut shows a non monotonous effect in SQI. On the other hand, Midwest showed a monotonous worsening in SQI. Interestingly, congested states like Illinois, New York, Massachusetts showed an improvement in SQI. To further illustrate why such a behavior has been observed, we analyzed the language in Twitter. Disambiguating and contextualizing the tweets using medical knowledge graphs, we observed patterns of improvement in conditions, which is in seeing in, as the decline in the tweets on depression, addiction, and anxiety. Much of these is due to meditation, yoga, indoor games, and increased use of streaming video platforms. 
Among many external factors, financial events and specific government interventions have substantial effect in the social quality of people, specifically business and individual relief announcements, business closures, increase in unemployment, and stay-at-home orders. Whenever the unemployment increase is much more significant than the previous week, the social quality is worse. And whereas, whenever the individuals and businesses are given financial relief, the social quality is getting better. Concerning coping with the pandemic, our content analysis shows different generations react to, pan, react to the pandemic differently. For example, Gen Z population takes the lockdown as a vacation, talking about video gaming and Netflix shows, but also drug abuse and abuse in their families. On the other hand, millennials are more worried about social distancing, unemployment, and government response. As you probably observed, this is a powerful tool that gives you real-time insight into how the policy actions impact the society. And it All right, so go back. And this allows me to uh, bypass uh, a lot of these slides. So, uh, and then I have, uh, you know, a bunch of things in terms of how, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the telehealth uh, related work that's happening during the COVID time frame, And uh, um, the same general uh, topics uh, on uh, using, for example, communication that you could have. Suppose I have a, a chat bot or, or a virtual assistant uh, to help with the mental health um, challenges uh, people face uh, uh, during COVID-19, then, you know, uh, how do you use these general techniques and knowledge and uh, AI techniques to uh, come up with the conversations that are meaningful to the patient? And here, deeper understanding of uh, mental health literature and knowledge that clinicians use is also very critical to get to that. In a very, um, you know, in general, what we are looking at is a highly multidisciplinary approach um, uh, that involves, uh, you know, neuro, neuro uh, the 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 uh, brain sciences and uh, cognitive sciences and so neuroscience, cognitive science, social sciences, and then go to the policy with computing. Very briefly, it was. Goisto is going to end ending this talk. Um, this is a class of work uh, that we have been doing quite a bit. Um, use of knowledge in deep learning uh, to understand the content better, and you know, um, understanding uh, social content that may have social harm is very difficult. Uh, and um, we want to use this approach. We are using this approach to reduce the bias, uh, provide and explain how did the model come with that um, conclusion. So both interpretation and uh, uh, explain. Uh, so use, using knowledge infused learning for explainability is a very important uh, uh, content we have. Um, all right. So there's some of the questions um, that also. Um, uh, you know, technology questions that come into the picture that I just post here, but uh, uh, this knowledge infused learning is the expression of knowledge, knowledge and application semantics to enhance existing deep learning methods by infusing their own conceptual information into statistical data driven computational approach. So that's the class of things that are coming in. There are a class of algorithms that are there. Uh, I, I like to present this one slide that gives you a very interesting insight. This is about um, understanding Reddit post uh, and uh, related to mental health and suicide. And uh, what it shows here is that here you have lexical and syntactic features on the left. Then you add TD, TFIDF, so more features. Then you add some contextual features, but now you're still in the linguistic and syntactic level. Then you have big uh, jump and big improvement uh, by using uh, contextual features weighted by DSM-5 knowledge hierarchy. DSM-5 is, by the way, the uh, medical, uh, you know, textbook or medical medical documentations that all 
uh, clinical, uh, uh, you know, mental health uh, people uh, learn, right? So this is me pure medical knowledge in textual form from which we create a uh, semi-structured and structured form of knowledge to apply to our uh, content processing. Then we added, uh, you know, uh, in addition to DSM, we added this drug abuse area, which is abuse and drug abuse and mental health are closely related. And then we added slang terms that you can't get, get from medical, uh, uh, you know, corpus. You have to use social or human knowledge. And we added that, and so we continue to get improvement. But the point here is that as you uh, keep on uh, adding uh, different variety of uh, uh, knowledge, the you know, specific knowledge and other knowledge, you reduce the false alarm rate. Uh, some of the many ongoing research at uh, our place, uh, uh, this is just some potpourri of uh, things that I threw together and uh, some of the work. All right, so that is okay. my talk and uh, yeah, probably yeah, the time. Okay, uh, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, interesting talk and covering a wide range of topics. Uh, we have just a few minutes left for questions and uh, I will, what I'll do is I'll, I'll begin with a couple of them from the chat and then uh, if there are questions pending at the end of the talk, I mean, you can add them to the chat, but if there's still some left over, maybe uh, you can be in touch with uh, Dr. Shet uh, directly. So, um, so let, let me begin with a with a uh, somewhat non-technical question from uh, Rahul Yadida. So what uh, Rahul is asking is um, uh, something about you know how to balance the advances in science and technologies that re rely on uh, psychology. Uh, I think he's thinking he's mentioned the Cam the Cambridge Analytic Analytica stand, uh, scandal, where uh, psychological knowledge was used as a way to manipulate people. So he wants to think about how can we benefit from psychology without exploiting people using psychology. Uh, how do we benefit? I mean, you have to use psychology, right? And um, yeah. um, I mean, uh, you, you saw that in most of the work we have, um, Shal uh, Valerie Shalin, uh, who is a, a psychologist, has been a uh, you know, member of our team. And uh, everything almost that we have done um, has involved use of cognitive science or psychology. Right. Uh, I, I think the comment was it may be exploited that people can use psychological knowledge to manipulate users. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, it goes both ways. It mm -hmm. goes with it. The point here is that uh, psychology is going to be used anyway. The cost of using psychology to do harm is lower uh, than the cost of coming up with a solution that uses psychology to prevent that harm. Uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, no, psychology is going to be used and is being used for causing harm. And, um, but we need to understand that we need to uh, convert that understanding into uh, techniques and algorithms and, uh, uh, you know, to counter that, right? So you can only uh, fight, uh, you know, you have to have similar weapon to fight, uh, uh, you know, uh, the problem you're facing. You can't uh, fight uh, uh, the guns with bow and arrow that effectively. So yeah. you have to use both sides. Great, yeah. And then uh, there's a comment from uh, Professor Ed Geringer, and he's he's just commenting on your your comment about gerrymandering that uh, he thinks it may be. Uh, either, I think he's talking about the processes by which uh, th these districts are drawn, and he thinks it should be that you should uh, somehow settle upon an algorithm uh, before the census data is released, so people would not try to game the algorithms to produce the results they wanted. Yeah. I don't but, know if you have any thoughts on that. No, uh, that, that is really uh, related to the political will and uh, process. Uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, um, and technology can help it if you have that will and process. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the party that is in um, power has, uh, you know, no use of that. So they, they want to benefit from whatever they are doing. So. Um, yeah, I, the, I mean, a lot of problems are so, uh, created by humans, not, so technology alone does not create the problem. It's the human desire to, uh, you know, sp spread rumor or conspiracy that's, uh, you know, um, creates a bigger problems. Some people are totally ignorant and they still do it, but technology uh, is a, more like a bullhorn. They, it, it kind of um, spreads the things much faster. And, and and basically allows people to be much more effective uh, in causing harm 
um, or, or coordinating ba bad, bad uh, you know, events and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, because of that technology's role in amplifying uh, these negative things, uh, we have to also have technology to contain that better. Okay, uh, great. I think we've come to the end of our allotted time, so I'm going to uh, stop the formal discussion here. I think people who are, uh, and I see some comments are coming in on the chat, but maybe uh, if you wouldn't mind, send uh, you, you can write to Dr. Shed directly, but if you don't know how to contact him, write to me and I will uh, put you in touch with him uh, as well. So at this point, let me, let me just uh, uh, thank, uh, uh, thank Professor Shed. So we had up to about 98 attendees in this talk.